Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we'll be looking at Satan and his demons in our continuing study of the doctrines of the Bible. We noted last time that both angels and demons are not central to, they're not part of the big idea of the Bible. Uh, the Bible focuses on God and his relationship with people and salvation history. Uh, so uh, while angels and demons are mentioned, they're really on the periphery. Um, and that's true of both demons and Satan as well. So it's still appropriate, though, to look at Satan. Uh, the term Satan, Satan would be the Hebrew, uh, describes an enemy. That's what the word means. Uh, in the Old Testament, and it is an Old Testament term, it is always used with the definite article. That is, it says Ha-Satan. Uh, we would say the Satan. So it's used as a title in the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament, we have the term diabolos. Uh, it's a compound word. The, the dia is alongside, and to bolo is to throw. Uh, so, you know, to throw alongside. But, but words are oftentimes more than the, just the sum of their parts. Uh, so actually the meaning is accuser or slanderer. Uh, and that works nicely. You know, an enemy does that sort of thing. An enemy accuses and slanders you. Uh, so uh, the two terms are sort of synonymous. Now, the term Satan is always used, in the, it's also used in the New Testament. Uh, it's a Hebrew word, but sometimes Hebrew words are taken and, and put with Greek letters, and, and it is in the New Testament. Uh, but when you have that in the New Testament, it does not appear with a de definite article. So by the time it gets to the New Testament, when you read of Satan, it is being used as though it were a name rather than a title. Uh, which is it? Well, probably a little bit of both. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, we read, The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old. By the way, when you see the serpent of old, that's a hint that may be back in the Garden of Eden. I remember the the serpent was involved in tempting the woman who, who then gave the fruit to the man and led to the fall into sin. Um, Satan was involved there, I would suggest, based upon this verse. Now, you don't find that out in, in the pages of Genesis. Uh, Genesis makes no mention of Satan, but this verse does. And so, notice the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. So, I've got both of those, uh, both the title uh, Diabolos and also Satan, uh, even though it's, we're in the Greek New Testament, uh, who deceives the whole world, tells me what uh, part of what Satan and the devil, uh, I'm, not using, I'm not saying two different people, uh, the same individual, uh, part of what he does is deception, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where you have the serpent doing the deceiving. Um, I would suggest, and, and I don't want to make this dogmatic, but I, I have a feeling that when you look at the, the serpent's actions, serpents can't talk. And so what you have there, I think, behind the scenes is Satan doing the action that results in the in the serpent talking. Uh, I think that's the case. Now, the, the passage doesn't say, but this passage seems to indicate that commonality. Now, from where did Satan come from? Uh, how do you know? Where do we see his uh, origins? Uh, well, all things were made from God. We see that in John chapter one verse three. All things came into being through him. That's actually speaking of the Word, uh, the Word who was with God, the Word who was God. All things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. Um, Satan has come into being. He exists. And so, therefore, uh, he was made by God. The Bible, however, does not specifically address the origins of Satan. Now, there's two passages that are sometimes used. Isaiah 14, verse 12. And the other passage, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 17. We're going to look at both of those passages. One of those, I don't think, refers to Satan at all. The other, we're going to have a little bit of a question mark. You know, maybe yes, maybe no. Let's look at both of those. I'm going to begin with Isaiah 14, 12, which starts out, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning. Now, the King James Version, uh, the, the rest of the verses, uh, you have been cut down to earth, you who have weakened the nations. Uh, in context, it's talking of the king of Babylon. Now, the King James Version says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? See the difference? Star of the morning, Lucifer, son of the morning. Um, now, that term Lucifer, uh, because of that translation, and the Hebrew, let me just say, the Hebrew text does not use the word, word Lucifer. That's not from the Hebrew. 
Um, But that has led to a popular mythos where you can go to almost anybody on the street, at least of my country, and say, who is Lucifer? And they will reply, oh, that's Satan, at least according to the Christian belief. Um, but, but they all know that. That's, that's become popular. Uh, I think it's become popularly wrong. Can I say it that way? Mm-hmm. Let's see why. So that, that phrase, O star of the morning, notice o, o Lucifer, son of the morning, uh, son of the dawn in, in uh, the Hebrew text, um, but O star of the morning, um, notice star versus Lucifer. How did we get that? The NIV renders it how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You see, morning star, Lucifer, star, O star of the morning, all from the same basic Hebrew word, the Hallel. The Revised Standard Version says, O uh, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star. So Lucifer, day star, star of the morning, morning star. Now that phrase, here's the the Hebrew, uh, Hallel, uh, Hallel is the Hebrew, and this was taken by Jerome. He was a he was a translator. He was going to translate the Hebrew text. This is in the 400s, from Hebrew into Latin because you know he was from the West, and um, the Bible had already been translated into Greek. The Old Testament had been translated into Greek. Of course, most of the New Testament was already written in Greek. Uh, I, in fact, I would say all of it had eventually made it into Greek. Uh, there's a little tradi- tradition that says Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. If so, we don't have it. Uh, our copy of the New Testament is all in Greek. But Jerome wanted to translate the Old Testament, and the New Testament too, for that matter. He wanted to translate the entire Bible into Latin. And so he, he was the one who brought about what we call the Latin Vulgate. It was called the Vulgate because it was written in the the common language, the way you say that in Latin, Latin is the vulgar language. doesn't mean nasty. It just means common. Um, and he came to this passage, and he rendered it uh, Lucifer. Uh, lux uh, is the word for light. And ferrer is the word to bring something. So the, the light bringer, star of the morning, morning star, the, the light bringer. And in his day, that term was used to describe the, the planet Venus. In fact, we call it sometimes the morning star. I don't know if you've ever heard that uh, use of the, the term, um, because when you in the morning, if you can see Venus in the morning, it will be the, the very last star that disappears, because it's so bright, uh, it will be the last star that disappears in the morning. And so for that reason, it is sometimes called the morning star. Um, and, and he recognized that, and he wanted to call it after that morning star. And so he gave it this title of Lucifer. Uh, and that, <laughs> that led to some, some mythos because, you see, he didn't, he didn't see Satan there. And no Jewish writer had seen Satan there either. Uh, so here, is, here it is, at Lucifer, you Lucifer. Uh, he he, he uh, translates it. Uh, now, first, or not for Second Peter, chapter one, verse nineteen. Uh, he also rendered Lucifer. Let's look at that because I think that's interesting. Second Peter one nineteen. Uh, he here's the passage. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Well, that's talking about the Lord and His light shining in your hearts. <laughs> and he, he rendered that Lucifer too. He certainly wasn't thinking that was Satan. Um, and, and he took the same term and rendered it there. Of course, that's Greek instead of Hebrew. Uh, but he rendered it the same way there in Second Peter 1.19. So there we have the morning star, just like in Isaiah 14.12, we have the morning star. In neither place does it refer to Satan. Now, we go from there to Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning of verse 11. Uh, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Now, let me just say, uh, Ezekiel 28, in the first part of the chapter, is talking about the prince of Tyre, uh, the, the, the leader of Tyre. And here it says, Take a lamentation over the king of Tyre. Um, 
sounds like it's speaking of the same individual, a lamentation against Tyre. And yet there's going to be uh, some things said about this king of Tyre that, that make you pause and ask, wait a minute, this sounds a little bit like Satan. As I said, uh, Isaiah chapter 14 really doesn't. It talks about his fall, how he, how he was proud, but that's the king of Babylon. Uh, here, the king of Tyre may be the same thing, but but there's a few things that maybe make us take another look. Um, that doesn't mean we say it's Satan, but, but let's look at it. So here's the king of Tyre, and it's being said about him, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, uh, that doesn't mean he was the uh, the most the smartest person around, but he was quite smart. He had uh, he had a great position, a a great reputation. We continue in the for the rest of the verse. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now that sounds like whoa. Wait a minute. Is that really uh, well? That's significant. Maybe not so much that it changes. This from the king of Tyre, but, but let's look at it. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. He goes on to mention these stones, the rest of verse, uh, verse 13. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, uh, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. Oop. Notice on the day that you were created, now, we could render that on the day you were born, on the day you came about, but he uses that term bara on the day in which you were created, they were prepared. That, that's, that's maybe significant too. We continue verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, that, that sounds an awful lot like what you have uh, in, on the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was a, was a box uh, overlaid in gold, and it had the statues of two cherubs. Um, their wings are overshadowed. They serve as sort of honor guards. But it doesn't say here, you were one of those cherubs. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Uh, remember the, the term anointed? We could render that messianic. You were the messianic, because that's what, what the word messiah means, uh, to anoint. Uh, the messianic cherub who covers. Uh, well, these, these things sound really striking, as though we are speaking of more than just a regular king in the uh, Middle East. And I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. So uh, it's, it's language that reminds us of the, that Ark of the Covenant, these angels, uh, the anointed cherub, uh, not just one of the two, but, but the anointed cherub. This, this sounds like a special, a special sort of device here. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And so all of these things sound a little bit, sound a little bit like perhaps an angel, uh, a cherub, uh, someone who was in Eden, someone who fell, and it makes us maybe draw the connection: is this Satan, or is this somebody who's being described in Satan terms? Uh, you know, which is it? Let's look at it. But from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. The verse continue, The passage continues, By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you out o, as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub. So he calls him that again, from the midst of the stones of fire. So, so the fall of this king slash being, whoever he is, cast out from the mountain of God. Now, mountain of God, that sounds like the place where God is, uh, um, the, the place from where he rules, O covering cherub. Verse 17, your heart was filled up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they, might, that they may see you. Now, at this point, it's sounding a little bit more like just a regular king. You know, Satan, I'm not sure if he was put before kings. Verse 18, by the multitude of your iniquities in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. So is this speaking prophetically of the end of Satan, or is this speaking of the fall of this Phoenician king? 
Verse 19, all who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified, and you will cease to be forever. Is this the king of Tyre, or is this Satan? Now, uh, there are, in, in, in view of the Satan idea, there are earlier references to the prince or slash leader of Tyre, but now, now we read of one who is the king of Tyre. If this is Satan, then, then this is perhaps the power behind the throne. Uh, he was in Eden. Uh, that sounds like Satan. Uh, he was, uh, it speaks of the day in which he was created. Uh, we weren't created, we were born. But, but Satan, uh, he, apparently he was created. Uh, he's described as the anointed cherub who covers. Uh, originally full of wisdom and beauty. All of those things make us think of Satan, a supernatural being. Notice he's cast down, cast out of heaven, cast to the ground. All of those, um, back when I was a lot younger, I just assumed, okay, this sounds like Satan. I'm going to go with that. And may, maybe I was right. But let's look also at some of the evidence that shows the other way. You see, he's described as the king of Tyre. So reading it literally, would you would just have seen that. Uh, Ezekiel describes Israel as having been created back in chapter 21, verse 30. So just because he was created doesn't necessarily indicate that that had to be supernatural because Israel came about very, very natural. Yes, God was involved, but, you know, it was not created for, at the beginning of creation. Um, the king of Egypt elsewhere in, in Ezekiel is described by Ezekiel as being like one of the trees of Eden. Well, that's, you know, that Eden use, that Eden description then is found earlier in Ezekiel and or later in Ezekiel, it's, it's found after this. Uh, so perhaps that's not determinative. Now we, like I said, the anointed cherub that covers that's that's pretty striking. But uh, I can't help but wonder: is this possibly some very figurative language describing the king of Tyre? So uh, the past king of Tyre, remember, had helped in the building of Solomon's temple, a place that represented Eden. So that would indicate why he has, why he especially has some of these titles, although we just said the king of Egypt has some one of those titles. But Tyre is supposed to be, you know, an insider helping to to fund and bring supplies and build a temple and do workmanship. Um, and so for them to turn against God and his people, that's a betrayal. It's almost can I say it this way? It's almost Satan-like. <laughs> All right, so so maybe the description here really is of the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre is now likened to one of those cherubim that were seen in Eden, but now he's fallen. He no longer is helping to build the temple. In fact, he's he's doing something quite the opposite. He's he's helping to try to destroy the temple. So is this also a picture? It is a king of Tyre. Is it also a picture of Satan? That's the question before us. Now, Satan as a continuing enemy. I'm not sure that we've answered the Ezekiel question, but but I'm going to leave it un unanswered because I'm not certain myself. And so I wanted to give evidence on, on both sides. But uh, Satan is still, in fact, uh, one fellow wrote a book entitled Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. Uh, and I would say he is alive. Uh, I'm not sure how well he is because he's a he's a defeated enemy, but there he is he does continue. First uh, Peter chapter five verse eight talks about his threat. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Um, so he is a, a threat. He's seeking to gobble up people. Uh, of course, he's a He's, he's a defeated th threat. He's been defeated by Jesus. But he's still, you know, as someone said, the tail of the dragon still swishes. Uh, it's, he's still here uh, on earth. Uh, there is a promise of victory. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Doesn't mean that you can do it on your own strength. But as you are submitting to God and submitting uh, and resisting the, the devil, then you are on the side of the one who is greater than the, than the devil. First John chapter 4, verse 4 speaks of his power. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 
So yes, Satan is powerful, but the one who is in you, who's in you, the Holy Spirit, God himself, uh, he is greater than Satan. And so there, it, this is not a conflict between two equal entities. Uh, it's not like that. God is the creator. God is, is the powerful one. And for the time being, he has allowed Satan to continue. But he is greater. Make no mistake about that. Satan is pictured in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Notice, those are, that's Satan's dominion. Those are Satan's um, minions, I guess we could call them. Another passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Doesn't say he is an angel of light. Doesn't even say he was an angel of light. Um, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. Um, I, I'm not sure the Bible is really clear on that. Uh, there are some indications in Revelation, some symbolism that talks about a third of the stars being cast down, and people have ta- taken that to mean, well, uh, that's that's the angels that were cast down, but it doesn't say that. And so we have to t- be careful about being too dogmatic in our statements on Satan's origins and on his forces. Uh, let's take it for what it says. Uh, he disguises himself as an angel of light. Uh, don't be fooled by that disguise. Uh, that's not real. Uh, verse 15, Therefore it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. They're not righteous. He's not an angel of light. And at least this passage doesn't say he is. Uh, it says and said that he disguises himself that way. Notice, uh, whose end shall be according to their deeds. Uh, and so their, deed, their, their end is already uh, foreknown, foretold, foreordained. Now, this brings us to speak of evil angels. We've, we've been seeing them already, but let's look for a moment at them. Um, the term demons, uh, diamonion, uh, um, the spiritual entities is the idea here. And let me confess, I'm going to take a leap here. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to uh, operate under the presupposition, maybe right, maybe wrong, uh, that the demons and evil angels are the same entities. Um, maybe they're, uh, are they two branches or just two descriptions? I don't know. I'm no expert on evil angels or demons, uh, but the Bible does speak of them. Um, the Bible also speaks of fallen angels, uh, where Jesus spoke of the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, so that seems to be the you know the devil's angels versus God's holy or chosen or elect angels. Uh, a, a distinction seems to be made of two different types of angels. I, I think demons are in there as well. But again, um, maybe that's more specific. Um, maybe that's just an, a, a description of all of them, but I couldn't I couldn't uh, say for certain that that's the case. Uh, their domain, Jude, in his little uh, epistle, only one chapter there, he speaks of the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. Now, he seems to be, uh, although you could probably take his words a few different ways, um, both here and later on in his epistle, in fact, later on there's an exact quote in his epistle that has uh, that's taken from the non-canonical Book of Enoch. Uh, I have elsewhere done an entire class just on the Book of Enoch, so I'm not going to uh, go into too much depth there. Uh, but the book, book of Enoch was a non-canonical. That means the, script, the Jewish people didn't look at it as being on the same level of Scripture. They thought it was an interesting book, uh, sort of fascinated. They were fascinated by it. Uh, we have copies of the Book of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they thought it was an interesting book, too. But they didn't hold it to be on the same level with, with Scripture. With, it, it didn't come down by the prophets. They, they didn't really feel it had been written by Enoch himself. Um, but there's a quote in there. This isn't the quote. The quote's later on in the chapter. Um, and the book of Enoch talks about um, those sons of God and daughters, daughters of men that you read about in Genesis chapter 6. And it takes the position, those are fallen angels. Uh, and so if that's if that is a correct interpretation, uh, here this verse would go along with that, but this doesn't say anything about sons of God or daughters of men or 
um, fallen angels uh, taking wives of men. It, it doesn't mention anything uh, like that. But that is in the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch is quoted. Now, let me just say, that doesn't mean that Jude believed everything was in the Book of Enoch was true, or that we should necessarily accept everything in the Book of Enoch as being true. Um, a, a stopped clock is correct twice a day. And the Book of Enoch can say some correct things without necessarily endorsing everything that's there. Uh, just like uh, Paul could quote a pagan philosopher, and he does that a few times. He quotes a pagan philosopher on at least three occasions in the New Testament. That doesn't mean he agreed with everything that pagan philosopher said. It only mean, meant that he said three things that were correct, and those three things were quoted. He may have said a few other things that were correct, too, but I couldn't prove it from the Bible. So we have evil angels. Now, uh, we see the reference to spirits that are seen alternately as unclean spirits uh, in the Gospels, like Matthew 10, 1, Mark 1, 27, and 3, 11, and 5, 13, and 6, 7, a number of times in Mark. Uh, we have evil spirits, so unclean spirits, evil spirits in Acts chapter 19, verses 12 and 13. Uh, we have seducing spirits in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We have spirits of devils, notice devils in the plural, Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. We are told that they believe in God. Now, this is really, again, this is in passing. This isn't to tell us a lot about, about, um, about fallen angels or demons or, or devils, but rather it's making a point just saying you believe in God doesn't, you know, even if you say, yes, I, I really do believe that God exists, that doesn't count for much. <laughs> because uh, notice James 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well, the demons also believe and, sh and shudder. Uh, they, they are very much believing that God exists. They're not on his side. They are against him. And just because you believe in God, well, you might believe in God and still be against him. That doesn't count for much, just, just believing that God exists. That's not saving faith. Saving faith is actually appropriating that salvation for yourself. And, and the demons, that doesn't describe them. Luke chapter 4, verse 34, uh, notice that demons, these evil angels, were able to recognize Jesus. And uh, let's pick up where they address him. They say, ha, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Demons could, they knew who Satan was or, or who Jesus was. And he actually told them, look, I'm, I, I take glory from people, but, but you don't, I'm not giving your permission to speak my name. And so uh, he actually rebukes them and then even casts them out. They have their own teachings. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, we cited, but let's read this. But the Spirit explicitly says that in, later uh, in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Where would I go to find doctrines of demons? Well, I think there are times where you can go into certain churches and maybe find doctrines of demons not being taught as such. You know, they don't say, uh, here, we're teaching doctrines of demons today but rather they're teaching as truth that which, is, that which is a lie. And I think that's what's being described here by Paul in his epistle to Timothy. One, oh, well, this isn't our last passage. We're, we're continuing. Uh, they're under authority. And he called, this is Jesus, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. So they had authority over diseases. But notice, uh, he deputized them. He had authority over them. And he gave them, at least for the time being, uh, power and authority over all the demons. And they went out and they exercised that authority, that, that deputized authority. And the demons, even though um, physically speaking, uh, let me just say, I think demons were probably a lot stronger than, than people are. But they had been given, the apostles had been given uh, spiritual authority and they exercised that. And the demons were forced to submit to that authority. Evil angels. Um, notice, even believers have on occasion been... Okay, I've got... Now, at this point, you might be tempted to think, well, my goodness, if the apostles were given that authority to cast out demons, if, if I see somebody that can cast out demons, they must be an apostle, they must have God's power 
Perhaps, however, however, Jesus talked about those that could cast out demons and yet not themselves be Christians. Even unbelievers have on occasion been able to cast out demons. Here's the words of Jesus, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? Do you see that? And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Here's a case of those that were that were not God's people, that were that had not been saved by Jesus. And on the last day, they they can point to miracles they could do. They could point to being able to cast out demons. Um, they could point to uh, prophetic things they had said. And yet, and yet they weren't Christians, and they are cast away from His presence. Now, uh, I'm not saying if you if if somebody does any of those things, then they're they're automatically cast. Uh, away from his presence. But those things are not necessarily definitive. And this is what Jesus tells us. Finally, we come to their end. Uh, two passages. First, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then he, and this is uh, speaking of the Lord in his after his uh, second coming. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. There is a place that has been prepared, and and it's going, let me just say, it's going to be overpopulated, um, not just by the devil and his angels, but also by by those who have rejected the, the Son, those who have rejected Jesus. Um, and and so they are they are cast out uh, at uh, on the last day. But also Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, notice, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. I said it was, it was heavily populated and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the end of the devil, the end of the, his angels, the end of all who reject Jesus. Uh, is a sober and serious one. It is described in both of these passages. No, notice, as eternal fire, as a lake of fire and brimstone. I'm not sure that we're supposed to take that literally. But however we're to take it, this is a bad thing. You do not want to go there. And so this is a call. This is a call to, to turn to, to Christ in faith and trust in him. Uh, leave the employee of Satan. You say, well, I'm not employed by Satan. Uh, yes, there's a battle going on, and you're on one side or the other, whether you realize it or not. But leave his domain and come and enter into the domain of the Son.